Heaven knows how you come across somebody once in a while you, you shouldn't have messed with. That's me. Well, I am not an African American. You're an Oreo cookie. White in the inside and black on the outside. I don't have an afro. I have an Amerifro. Talking that idiotic stuff you talk about, I will slap you. Go ahead. Make my day. Black as the ace of spades, but 100. 100% American. Heard around the world by everybody and their mama. The Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show. Uniting the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We're also rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Welcome to the third edition of the Jesse Lee Peterson Show today. Thank you so much for being with me. You can get involved by calling 888-775-3773, 888-77-JESSE. I have back with me for a part two. Pastor Ted Haggard is here. He is founding pastor of St. James Church in Colorado Springs. St. James is the second church he and his wife, Gail, started in 35 years. Uh, he previously built up New Life Church from 20 people in a basement to 14,000. 14,000 people. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and he was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. You wrote a very interesting article, Suicide, Evangelicalism, and Sorrow. You, said, you start off by saying, um, this is from Ted's blog, and we got it from the Blaze. Joel Hunter, pastor of Northland Church, and Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, both had sons take their own lives this year. I know of five other wonderful Christian families that also had sons who took their own lives. Some researchers are reporting that the suicide rate among evangelicals is the same as that of the non-Christian community. How sad. I didn't know that it was that high, suicide rate was that high in the uh, Christian community. But why didn't Joel Hunter's son, as well as Rick Warren's son, why did they take their lives? Well, they're very different situations, and I don't pretend to be close to those situations. I haven't talked to Joel or Rick since 2006 when oh, okay. I went through my own scandal. But but uh, Rick, Rick Warren's son struggled with mental illness. Rick was very public about that, he and his wife on CNN and other places. Yeah, I remember seeing that. And then Joel's boy had been through uh, a scandal in his church and had lost the church, and because of it, went through a divorce in his marriage. Oh, he wasn't an adult then, huh? Oh, yeah, both of them were adults. Okay. Both of them were adults. They were young men, uh, um, and so he was living in an apartment by himself and trying to make a living in the secular world, and uh, that's when he got discouraged and took his life. And so because, was he, was he a pastor of the church? Yes, he he and a bunch of buddies from school had started a a very successful large church, and uh, and then he had an affair in the midst of that. And my premise is that those I know we will all say, well, those are the consequences of his actions. That's true, but our issue is we we in the New Testament church offer the solution to the sin problem. And sometimes our responses to people that are going through their own sin problem or the consequences of it, sometimes our response actually makes it worse rather than being a solution. We start to think we're the DA or the journalists and need to report and need to make it worse instead of the solution. We are to represent Christ, which means we need to be the healers. We need to be the restorers, the redeemers. And so my argument was, that uh, we need to be providing more solutions rather than so much judgment. When the, the, this, uh, uh, let's see here, Joel Hunter's son, 
uh, an adult man, uh, uh, apparently cheated on his wife, ended up in a divorce. So did the, ch- did the folks of the church run him off or they rejected him? Well, of course, there's a variety of stories on that, and that is not the point. The point is that we know for sure there, there, here, I, what I do is in that article, I go to my story and I talk about in the midst of my despair, I received up to 70 hateful letters a day from spirit filled Christians. And where the Christians were reading a newspaper article and believing it and then writing hateful, awful things. Now, <laughs> now That's I'm not amazing. saying I wasn't worthy of a hateful letter. What I'm saying is that's not the role of the church, and that the role of the church is to be redemptive and life-giving and healing and restorative and helpful. If the church's role is to add burden onto people's lives, then that that means we're right there with the district attorney's office. We aren't here to add burden to people's lives. And we're not here to judge other people's lives or blame other people. We're here to heal and restore and strengthen and love and care. We're here to be just like Jesus. Jesus will leave the 99 and go for the one. Jesus Jesus is the one that raises the dead. He doesn't kill them. He, he, he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And so our role is to be like Jesus. Our role is not to take on the other roles that may be justified and may be right. It's just not our role as a church. You know, in reading your article, it occurred to me, especially with uh, Pastor Isaiah Hunter, who is the son of Joel Hunter, um, you know, he lost his, he ended up in a divorce, and then he was made, became an outcast with the church. I don't think many Christians consider what that person is thinking and feeling once once they turn their back on him or her, they don't know that the people start to feel, at, you know, anxiety. They feel alone. They feel depressed. They feel fear. They feel like they have just been abandoned by a fam, you know, close family members or something. I don't think the Christian consider, and that's why I wanted to really talk to you about this. I don't think they consider what, well, what is this person going through that I'm turning my back on just because I've found out that they have sinned or done something that I thought was wrong, and now I'm just going to turn my back on him or her, talk about them, and destroy them. I don't think they ever consider what the person is going through. Well, and that, that's exactly right, which is the point of the article. The, the, um, the whole idea is that we say we're, we're like Christ. Well, Christ doesn't turn his back on people when they sin. And see, that's another point. That's another point. Christ never turns his back. All he said is that we should just repent and move on. And actually, the opposite is true. Christ actually came to the earth because we had sinned. Yes. And and he comes to us closer. Jesus even says that he came for the unrighteous. He did not even come to the earth for those who think they're righteous. And so if we withdraw from people because we find out they're sinners, well, number one, that means we don't know our Bible because the Bible teaches us that all everybody sins. All right. And the only time we'll stop sinning completely is when we see Christ face to face. All right. And so, number one, if we're shocked when we find out somebody is a sinner, that just means we're naive. And then number two, if we if we withdraw from them because they're sinners, that means we're not Christians. Because Christian means Christ-like, and Christ Christ identifies with the sinner. He draws close to the sinner. He is numbered with the transgressors. And so he's not numbered. With, they didn't put him on the cross because he was numbered with the righteous guys. They put him on the cross because he's numbered with the transgressors. Well, how do you change the mindset of Christians who have not been taught how we as brothers and sisters of Christ should treat one another in time of trouble because that mindset is not there as to how we should treat one another in those well, times. He, here's what I think the foundation of that is. Yeah, of course, God is love. His essence is love. And love means living for the good of the other person. 
So God loves us. He lives for our good. Jesus is making intercession for us right now. The Holy Spirit's within us, and God the Father sent his Son because he loves us so much. And so so God loves us. God lives for our good. And we are then to live for the good of other people. All right? We did some research, and we learned that there is not one evangelical seminary in America that has a class exclusively devoted to how to apply love in a difficult church or family situation. There's not a Bible school in America that teaches how to apply love in a difficult church or family situation. And there's not a mega church conference workshop that we were able to find that is exclusively devoted to teaching people how to apply biblical love in a difficult situation. So here's our situation. We are in a church with not one leader that has thoughtfully contemplated God's New Testament love and how to apply it. Therefore, we naturally go to punishment. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll pick up right after this break. Back in a moment, folks. Pastor Ted Hager is here, 888-775-3773, talking about his article. And I want to get to this selling service, too. Uh, suicide, evangelicalism, calism, and sorrow. And it's about pastors and their children who have committed suicide because they couldn't handle, in some cases, the scandals that uh, broke out and how the church Instead of turning their back on the brother or sister, that's when you're supposed to love even more so. And I personally don't think that, because to be honest with you, I just recently started thinking about this. What do, you know, how do people handle it, handle it when their church or congregation or turn their back on them? And they do get lonely, they... You know, they, they start hating themselves, and it just and they end up taking their lives. And I don't think the Christians realize or consider what that person is going through. Uh, Pastor Hager, my audio engineer here, Andre, has a very interesting question about, uh, let's see here. And Andre, I need you to go to the mic and ask him this question because you can say it better than I can. And uh, let's see here. I want to just read what you wrote here. He said, what if they are harming you or your family? How do you, you know, love in that situation? But I'll let Andre ask that question. Good morning, Reverend. Good morning. Uh, My question is, you know, there's a difference between people who deliberately do harm or deliberately do bad things. And then there's folks who do it yet know they're doing it and can't help it in some way. Now, how do you love the one who's deliberately doing it, has no remorse about it, has, doesn't feel sorry about it, continues on doing it, and doesn't back down at all? Yeah. Well, our exhortation is to love. And that, that as you know, my definition for that is to live for their good. Now, Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers. Jesus called the Pharisees white-walled sepulchers, in other words, graves looking good on the outside, but full of dead men's bones. And, and we have to respond to people the same way at, for their good. So our thought process has to be, I'm devoted to them, whether they're scoundrels or not. I'm not even going to make the judgment about that because somebody, because it, it's impossible to know. Some people will say, well, if they repent, I'll be loving, but if they don't repent, I won't. There's no way to know who's repenting and who's not. And so so if somebody is being a predator, that's when 1 Corinthians 5 applies, and that's when they have to be uh, put out so that they are not, so they don't have access to continue being a predator. But 
we in the church don't put them out because we hate them or we've judged them or we are bitter at them or any of that. We put them out for their own good so they won't have opportunity to sin or so that they will not so that they will not continue to be a predator. So the underlying thing is whether or so the underlying issue is we don't have to judge what's going on on the inside of them but we have to do what we think is right for their best good and and when we do that then that may that may be some pretty harsh things or it may be some pretty kind things loving does not always mean kind Love, loving always means your thought processes are for their benefit. Does that help, Andre? Yeah. Um, so basically you're saying, let's say, for instance, someone is harming my family with their presence. Um, I put them out for their own good rather than putting them out so that he can, he would, so that I can protect my own family from, from him. Well, you've got a responsibility to love your family, too. And, and so, yes, you've got two things going on there. One is you're loving your family, which means you're protecting them from a threat. Two, you're loving that fella because you're saying, look, when you're here, you have opportunity to cause damage. And I don't want to provide that opportunity to you any longer because I care about you. I'd rather you live a good life. And so because I care about you, you're not going to have an opportunity to be here anymore. Okay, makes perfect sense. So basically, it's uh, it's more of a state of mind rather than um, rather than the actions itself. It's how you think. It's how you feel about it. Well, which is always the case. I mean, yes. if your role is is punishment, you say, "Well, look, I've got to protect my family. Therefore, I hate you." Yeah, it makes well, sense. Well, then you're in <laughs> trouble yourself. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. But if you sense. say, "I've got to protect my family, and I also care about you." And I don't want you to have opportunities to do damage anymore, and I want to protect my family. So for your good, I'm taking this action. Okay, so it's the attitude. It's the attitude. Well, Christ says that we're to love one another. And so, so we've got to figure, and Christ is the picture of that. And we have him healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and we also have him turning over the tables of the money changers, saying that you've changed this place from a house of God into a den of thieves. And so we know that he was doing it for their good, so we have to just make sense of that, and it's easy for us to do that. Very good question, Andre. The, Very good. Yeah. You know, I know that you're right about this, and the only way I know that you're right, uh, t about 26 years ago now, 26 years ago, I... Prior to the 26 years, I had a lot of anger inside of me. And uh, and at that time, I was claiming to be a Christian, but I had anger. You know, I had not forgiven my parents for their weakness and mistakes they made. And I would resent most all my situations that I had to go through if they were tough situations. And so I did not know that I was supposed to love in spite of what I was going through, I had no uh, right to hate anyone. But God took away my anger. He caused me to repent. He took away my anger and gave me his love to function from, operate from. And the last 26 years, I've gone through a lot. and But it's impossible for me to hate uh, the people or person who brings this upon me. I always think of them because I realize that they don't know what they're doing. And if they right. had love, they wouldn't do certain things to you, right? And See, so, that, that, that's a huge, huge point where Jesus said that he, forgive, he forgives the people who hung him on the cross because they don't know what they're doing. See, I am convinced that the people that hated me so much eight years ago during my scandal— they just didn't know what they were doing. They did not. Absolutely. They, they'd, trained, they'd been trained by certain leaders in the body of Christ to blame and to judge and to hate and to scorn others and to be kind of arrogant. But see, I would not have known. And then I read in the scriptures that we're supposed to love God first with all our heart, soul, and might, along with nothing else, and then love our neighbors as ourselves, right? Yeah. And so I real, but I realized that 
the person who's trying to harm me is my neighbor. They can't help themselves. They know not what they're doing. And so pray for them instead of worried about me because it's not about me. It's about them doing it. But I would not have known that had not God changed my heart and showed me that. And I don't know how people are going to get it unless that happens. I'll let you respond to that right after this break. Okay, welcome back, folks. I just want Pastor Haggard to respond to what I said about, you know, the only way I discovered or realized how to love people who were mean to you or whatever is that God changed my heart. He took away my my judgment, my resentment of myself and others, and he replaced it with just love is there, nothing but love. And so now when I go through things or situations should come, I just don't think of me, even though the devil tried to tempt me to think of me, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. But my heart won't let me go with that. I, I, I think of the people or person or whatever the situation may be, I think about them because I know if they had God in their heart, if they had love, if they had an unforgiving heart, they would not do the things that they do. And it's weird living that way. Uh, so Pastor Hager, can you, uh, you know, that's all the reason I discovered that I should never, there's never a reason to, to, uh, resent or judge. Uh, you should, according to the scriptures, we're not supposed to even remember grievances, grievances, but people do remember those things. Well, see that, and that is exactly what marks us as a Christian. What marks us as a Christian is the fact that we don't hold other people's sins against them. Yes. When, and when people get violated, when you get violated, when you get hurt, when you get disappointed, when somebody takes advantage of you, if you demand justice, that means you're just like everybody else. But if you're able to forgive them, release them, and then do what's best for them, yes. that marks you as a Christian. See, love Love really counts when something's gone wrong. That's when love when, counts. Yeah. When, you've, when you're having a bad day and somebody's gracious to you, that's when it really counts. Yeah. And so now, see, here's what you're into that now, though, with what you've just said. Jesus said, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn the other. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Jesus said, if they want you to go one mile, go two. That's what you're talking about. And see, people people think those are kind of ethereal, mystical ideas. But no, what they're saying is if somebody insults you, if somebody violates you, if somebody takes your dignity, if somebody wounds you, then you just turn the other cheek. And then somebody would say, well, isn't that not being responsible? Well, it depends on what you're responsible to be. And if you're responsible to be a Christian, then be a Christian. And this is how we mark ourselves. See, here's where we've made a mistake in the last 40 years with the religious right. With the religious right, we kind of got the idea that we were right, they were wrong, we were good, they were bad, and they're the problem and we need to blame them. And so we, in essence, gave the whole church the room or theological permission to blame others for our problems. And we ended up with an, with the unintended consequence of being of being perceived as arrogant. And so so now what we're saying is uh, that's one thing. This is another. Now we need to understand that when people sin amongst us, we shouldn't blame them. We shouldn't be their enemy. Our goal shouldn't be to punish them and make sure they're embarrassed and their kids are and wife are all embarrassed and shamed. But instead, we need to heal, we need to restore, we need to redeem, we need to love, we need to give opportunity for gracious kindness. And we've got to remember that it is the kindness of God that led us to repentance. It wasn't his sternness. Yeah. You know, 
I want to squeeze in some calls here. Time is going by. Yeah, yeah, know. let's take some but calls. Let me just ask this. Can a person know this without the born-again experience? Yes, I, well, I think, I, I don't know that we know for sure when the born-again experience happens. I know a lot of people that have said that prayer and weren't born again. Well, I'm not referring to in a prayer. I'm just saying all the reasons I know that this is true because he changed my nature. He, you know, he... T- yeah, and I, I, think that, I think that progressively uh, progressively happens as we... It, the answer to your question is no. We can't fully do it without the born-again experience. The secondary follow-up to that question is, is we all need to grow in Christ, walk down this road the Holy Spirit's walking us on, and then we will grow from glory to glory just like Paul did. Let's go out to Sacramento, California, and talk to Christina. Christina, you're on with, thanks for calling, you're on with uh, Pastor Haggard. Good morning, gentlemen. It's an honor to speak to both of you. Thank you. And uh, this is such an important topic to bring up, and I thank you for doing so. Um, I... For the longest time, I can't tell you, I mean, I'm 50 years old, and I have been praying for to forgive my parents for what what I had to endure, um, you know, as a child. And I finally, finally, by the grace of God, can see that it wasn't their fault, that, um, you know, I have, for a power struggle, wanted to hold it over them, which hasn't been good for me. But my question to you, how do you know if it's real that you finally have forgiven? Yeah, very good question. And uh, unforgiveness, uh, let me translate the word unforgiveness for you. Unforgiveness simply means you owe me something. Right. And so if we can just, and see, you said, I realized it wasn't their fault. It doesn't matter if that was their fault or not. You've got to forgive them or it's going to hurt you. It'll hurt me. And I think, Pastor, I, I thought I'd forgiven them. I thought right. I had, but then I realized I didn't. So I just, I really, that is the way the, I want this to be real, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that is the way it works. And the way, and it'll be tested. Like you'll forgive them, then you'll see them again, and something will trigger inside of you. Yes. And then you just have to consciously say, I am not going to live that way. I'm going to love these folks. So the way, the antidote to unforgiveness is to determine to live for their good. And so that's love. And so when you're with your parents, don't say, okay, I need to forgive them. Say, I need to find ways to love them. Okay. Now, so, in my case, it's a little unique. They're both passed away. Okay. Um, so I just have the memories of it, of all the abuse, et cetera. And, well, and they'll come up in discussion, I would think. Right. And when they come up with discussion, say, okay, how can I love them? How can okay. I honor them? Because, see, now you are the steward of their reputation. It's true. And so, so okay, Here's the, this brings up a great thing. You're going to love that. Hold that thought, sir. Let me take a quick break. When I come back, I'll allow you to finish that with Christina. Back in a moment. I cannot believe how fast this hour has gone by. It's amazing. Um, uh, uh, Pastor, what I need you to do before you answer for Christina is tell the folks how to get to your, read your articles and your website and all that good stuff. Yeah, if you'll go to tedhaggard.com or stjameschurch.com, S-A-I-N-T, jameschurch.com, uh, there you can find the information on Rome. You can find uh, blogs. You can find all those different things, and and those cover all the things we've been talking about. Uh, Christina, you see her there? You know, thank you so much. I am. I, I There was a lady who had been in a concentration camp and was experimented on during the Holocaust, and she uh, came out of it alive. Her twin died, you know, and she goes around the country and speaks about forgiveness, and I admire this woman 
you know, and I think, God, help me. How? I read that in church one day. Someone gave me that little, that information. It was a powerful story. Who can do this, you know? I mean, only by the grace of God. But and let I, me ask, we, we, we only have about two minutes left here. Sure. Pastor, Christina wanted to forgive her parents. They are now, uh, they are now yeah, they're, inspired. They're but let me, now. let me ask, if Christina, and you can answer this for me too, Pastor. If Christina, she now has her own family, I'm sure there are things she has done to her children, be, you know, impatient or yelled at them or whatever, and she didn't want to do it because she loved her kids, loved her kids. If she could realize that her parents feel the same, felt the same way about her, wouldn't, you know, they didn't want to be mean or yeah, they didn't yeah, want to. Yeah, no. It, there's no reason to even get into the they intended to or they didn't to or whatever. We just need to be like Jesus no matter what's in them. I know, but the point it, is she wouldn't want to be hated or resented for the mistake no. she made. So her parents feel the same way or felt the same well, way. Well, maybe. And so we, we know for sure about Christina because she can say what's inside yes. of her, but her parents are gone. Here's the point. Jesus is, the, is at the right hand of the Father bragging about us right now, but we're not perfect. So we can brag about one another. Jesus puts the best spin on us. We can put the best spin on one another. We are responsible to build each other's reputations because Jesus is building our reputation. That is such a good and the right way to live. Christine, I hope that helped a little bit. You know, that does. Uh, that, it does. Because uh, I want to go around and talk uh, about, you know, all the mistakes she made. Et cetera, yeah, and like, drop do that. Do the opposite. Jesus is making okay. it. Jesus is bragging about you right now, Christina. So brag about your parents. It's not being phony, huh? You don't have to give every detail. Jesus isn't giving every detail of your sins to the Father. We're so out of time. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. By Bond, Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. Views expressed by guests and callers on today's program may not necessarily represent the views of the station. For more information, call 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. Or visit our website at bondinfo.org.